Today's topic is local historic districts, and we have two uh, resident experts here to talk to you about local historic districts. Um, first up is going to be Megan Duvall. Now, Megan is the historic preservation officer for the city and county of Spokane. You may remember her. She used to be in my position. It has been six years. Can you believe it? Yeah. I know. Uh, so, so she spent nearly 15 years here at DAP before she went to Spokane. She was also uh, has been the executive director of the Enumclaw Downtown Partnership, which is a Main Street. During her tenure in Spokane, she has expanded the number of properties listed on the Spokane Register of Historic Places from under 400 to well over 700 with the, the recent local register district listings they have done, Brown's Edition and um, East Central Neighborhood. Oh, 700 property survey the East Central Neighborhood. She's overseen historic incentives of over $114 million in historic property rehabilitations since 2015. And she's also uh, reimagined the city's historic preservation ordinance to increase the protection of Spokane's um, historic resources. Megan is a native of Spokane and a graduate of the Savannah College of Art and Design and also Washington State. We can't leave that out. She's a WSU grad. So she has an MFA in historic preservation and she's a very good artist too. We miss her graphic design skills around here for sure. <laughs> um, so uh, please welcome Megan if we would clap, you know, if we were all in a room together. And then um, secondly, but not secondly, Mr. Logan Campo Reale works uh, for Megan in her office. He is a broadly trained public historian living in Spokane. He graduated with an MA in history from Eastern Washington University. Logan has experience doing local history research, preparing register nominations, developing educational programming, and curating museum exhibits. So he currently works as a historic preservation specialist for the city of Spokane. Logan was actually a resident of Brown's Edition when the neighborhood embarked on its effort to form a local historic district. And so, and then he became a staff member when it was time to get the district actually listed. So he has seen it from both sides. Um, Logan's interested in storytelling in our ever-changing digital environment. He's a contributor to spokanehistorical.org. So check out Logan's work on spokanehistorical.org. And he also blogs at thelocalhistory.com. His research on segregated housing policies and mid-century Spokane property documents was featured in the Spokesman Review. So he's been in the newspaper as well. So please welcome Logan. Yay, Logan. All right. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our lovely presenters. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Feel like I'm slipping into my old shoes here. Hi, all UCLG folks. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I think the really exciting part is that Logan, literally, his position was just created in this budget cycle, and we, uh, after some blips and blops with the city council, got it, got it actually approved last week, and so he will soon be an actual official city of Spokane. Um, uh, employee doubling the size of our staff in Spokane, which is super exciting. So we're coming for you, Tacoma. <laughs> Not quite in county yet, but we will. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I'm really excited to have Logan with me. He's been a project employee with me for the last two years, and he's actually been the one to create the documents um, for our second district that we'll talk to you about, the Cannon Streetcar Suburb Historic District. Um, but so really what our plan is today, and um, is to talk to you about how we've gone through this process in the last couple of years. I think, I don't think a lot of people are doing local historic districts um, anymore. It's, um, it's hard, <laughs> it's not an easy thing. Um, so we'll go to the next slide here, Logan. There we go. So why, why local historic districts? So in Spokane, we'll just give you, this is gonna be an example of Spokane, but I think that there's gonna be some things that you can take um, that will apply to your communities as well. And something I was gonna say that I think would be really interesting is in the chat thing, if you would tell us what communities you're from, 
um, because I only recognize a couple names in there. Um, things have changed in six years. Um, so that would just be great. So we just kind of have an idea if you're like a small town or counties or bigger. Um, so yeah, awesome, thank you. So um, why did we even sort of endeavor to, to take this on in Spokane? And the big reason was Spokane um, actually did something that the National Park Service doesn't really like for local communities to do, which is we actually did at one point add something to our ordinance that allowed us to regulate national register properties only in districts and only when it applied to demolitions. So if you had a property, a contributing house in a national register historic district and you wanted to demolish it, the old way was in Spokane, you had to have a replacement structure. You couldn't just demolish it. It was kind of, I used to call it the no surface parking lot ordinance. So you couldn't just demolish it for parking, but you, as long as you had a replacement structure, we had to sign off on the demolition permit. So it really wasn't a particularly strong ordinance, um, but we did do a little regulation of National Register Historic District. So that's why it might seem a little bit confusing about why we're talking about the loss of, um, of properties in a National Register Historic District, because really that's supposed to be honorary only, as you all know. So um, we've strengthened that since then, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. But so what, what happened was in particularly in Brown's edition, which is really our first residential neighborhood just adjacent to our downtown, there were um, several teardowns um, with new construction put in its place. Um, you know, many more units, um, apartment buildings, but we had to sign off on the demolitions. And at that time, we weren't looking at what the new construction looked like. Nobody was, except for just our typical um, current planners in our building department. Does it have enough windows? Is there a door? I mean, th those were the kinds of things, you know, the tick mark things. No one was looking. Is it compatible with the neighborhood? Does it fit in? So, um, so that was a big part of the reason why neighborhoods came to us and said, hmm, why are you letting people tear things down in historic districts? And I said, because we have no way of stopping them. So these neighborhoods reached out and said, well, what can we do? Are there any tools that we can do um, to help us protect the, our, the character of our neighborhood? Because especially Brown's edition, lots of changes over the years. This was the initial place where um, the lumber barons and mining magnets were building their mansions. Um, they started to change over to apartments very early um, in the process, in, you know, in the really in the 1920s and 30s, and then really hit it hard in the 40s. Um, they were losing buildings and new infill um, apartment buildings were, were going up, um, a lot of them very incompatible. But so anyway, so they were already at a tipping point where they're like, geez, you know, we might not even have enough contributing properties. So Although we had the ability to create districts in Spokane, we didn't really have a process to establish them. So we'll talk a lot more about that. Logan, I think we can go to the next slide and just show you what we're talking about with these, um, with these districts. So these were, the, um, these were the properties that were demolished um, to make way for the buildings on the right. So we call Big Blue the one in the upper right-hand corner that replaced the two um, buildings just uh, to the left of it. Um, and those, you know, the, the two homes that were demolished to create Big Blue were, I mean, they had been, you know, not really demolition by neglect, but definitely deferred maintenance for a lot of years. They were, I mean, they weren't great, um, but they were contributing to the district that had been formed in 1974. And then the lower one, um, is a, you know, an 1890s house that really could have been restored. Of course, the developer cried and screamed and kicked and said how much he loved the neighborhood and how much he really wanted to restore it, but it was just too far gone. Um, I don't believe that, uh, as you can tell, and that's what he put in its place. So it is across the street from Coeur d'Alene Park, one of the earliest parks in the city, um, on a very prominent uh, corner on a block that actually had not had any um, intrusive infill. And uh, this was the what we call the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. So we can go to the next slide. Are you, oh, there we go. 
Um, so then uh, that was all Brown's edition. We're, we're currently working on our next uh, district. And this one is another, you know, sometimes you just have to have that impetus, what starts things um, and starts the neighborhood talking about what can we do to protect the character and, and sense of place of our neighborhood. And so this one is another National Register Historic District. It's the Ninth Avenue um, National Register District. And there were these three properties that were on this weird little piece of a block um, that is zoned uh, commercial and multifamily. And these houses were all three, they were contributing to the residential district, um, but they truly had been uh, subject to demolition by neglect. Uh, they had not been cared for. They were owned by the Rosars family. So people like Michelle who've lived in Spokane know um, Rosars is one of our big grocery stores. And there is um, a Huckleberry's grocery store right behind this and an Ace Hardware. So they were sitting on this little key portion of the block. What they really wanted to do is demolish these homes and create surface parking for their employees because it's in a, you know, it's in a dense residential historic neighborhood. Um, and their parking lot uh, is it, they didn't feel was adequate for, for employees and and for um, customers. So they wanted to do that. And that was something specifically they could not do. They could not demolish these. We could actually say no to that because they couldn't demolish them for surface parking. Surface parking was never going to be allowed in that area anyway, so it was kind of a moot point. But that said, they finally, after years and years and years of fighting and wanting to tear these down because they didn't have residents in them, who they kicked out, they kicked out their renters. Um, it ended up being properties that were getting squatted in, they caught on fire, there was all kinds of problems. So they finally sold it to an architect who built um, this infill property. Now the neighborhood hates it. I would say it's not terrible infill actually, but um, neighborhood doesn't like it. So that got them started talking about historic districts. So we can go to the next slide, Logan, which I think you, you start to take over. Yeah. Awesome. So does anybody have a local historic district that is already established in their community? And don't hesitate to unmute and, and tell us uh, if you do. Anybody? Hi, I'm Katie I'm in Bellingham, and we have something that operates like a historic district, a local historic district, and that's Fairhaven because we have a design overlay, but that's it. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Ultimately, in Spokane, as you'll learn shortly, we'll, that's ultimately what our local historic districts are as well. Um, the, the end result is an overlay zone that shows on the zoning map. So. Um, excellent. That's a good lead way. Anybody else that wanted to share if they had a, a, a local historic district and, and maybe quickly how it operates like that? I see in the um, Waterville, Dayton, and Wenatchee. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. So Spokane has had a few local historic districts for decades. Um, we had a, one around Corbin Park and one in our Hilliard neighborhood, um, but they didn't work very well. Um, due to the way the ordinance that enabled them was, was crafted. Um, in the, basically, uh, what it created was a series of individually listed homes. Each property owner was required to sign a management agreement, so sort of their contract, um, versus having sort of a, a vote to establish a district with certain boundaries. So in Corbin Park, for example, there was wide acceptance, but there were a few property owners, and there have been some since the district was created, who wanted to opt out. And the city maybe had some legal ground to fight that and could have said, no, you signed a management agreement, um, but they didn't really want to fight that battle. And so most of the time when people have asked to back out, they have just backed out. And in the Hilliard district, uh, there wasn't really good adoption in the first place either or, or anyways. And so we only ended up with a handful of properties that are actually listed, even though the work was done really for, for many more. So does anybody have a district already that establishes um, or that can be established by a vote? We talk, I see we, we heard a few districts, but does anybody have a voting process already? Cool, so it sounds like Dayton does have a vote as well. Um, and in Wenatchee too, cool. So we'll talk a little bit about how our vote works. That can be crafted differently in the ordinance and there was some horse trading when the ordinance was crafted 
on how exactly that uh, the majority would be decided and how the vote would go. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then also, um, awesome, 50% or more in Bellingham, similar, similar for us. Um, does your ordinance clarify that contributing properties to a historic district are eligible for incentives? You know, you could pop it in the chat there, but I think this is critical. Um, if you're going to create the stick, as we like to say, um, you also need to have the carrot along with it. And so making sure that the incentives that would generally be extended to individually listing properties must also be extended to contributing properties if you want to have any chance of success. And I might jump in just for a second. Logan, yes. just want me to bounce back. agreement? Just a, just a, oh, sure. oh you're, you're fine, whichever way. So in Spokane, it's a little bit different than most communities that I worked with. I was the CLG coordinator that we actually require every property that gets listed. I know Seattle creates an ordinance for each property that's listed, but in Spokane, we actually have a recorded management agreement. So it's basically the contract between the property owner and the city or the county at the time that the property was listed. And then we record that with the deed with the audit, the county auditor. So that is that is something that I always thought, oh God, that's such an extra step, you know, isn't it just enough that it's listed? That really gives us the legal authority. So that was really that big sticking point, as Logan mentioned, is how do we create these districts without management agreements? So like, you know, it said every property that's listed on the Spokane Register has to have a management agreement, which would basically exclude the ability to have districts in the future. So just wanted to give another little explanation of what a management agreement is. I know that's not universal. So go ahead. And although we had had a couple successful districts, like I said, we had also had some that really that 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 hit a roadblock because of the management agreement when it, they were all excited about getting the district going and the nomination. But then when it came time to sign the management agreement, our peaceful valley neighborhood put their hands up and walked away. And so again, lots of work done to form a district. Um, never formed, and 20 years later, or almost 20 years later, the neighborhood's still talking about it. Um, maybe one day they'll get to it, but again, the management agreement was scary then, and we have a new process now, so who knows. So what are the critical elements to a new ordinance? I don't have one yet. Um, I think I, I kind of identified three critical elements. Um, one is a process to establish a district by a majority vote or petition. Um, this is uh, this is what, like I said, what enables you to sort of draw some boundaries and say, this is the area that we deem significant. This is the story that we're trying to tell. And we want to have a vote amongst the property owners to create this district. Folks who may not agree with it will have to still play by the rules if the majority decides, like many things in our world work. Establish how the second thing, establish how the district will be designated and recognized. We already talked a little bit about this. In Spokane, we use an overlay zone, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. How can you, how do you designate it, and how do you make sure that everybody knows that this exists now? And then also explain how COAs and demolitions will be handled. Uh, Megan already talked a little bit about how we, we made some changes to our demolition ordinance, um, but this, this is also important. How will you do COAs in the district, and will you um, review demolition or, or even new construction? So we're going to run through those things. So first was the vote. Um, this was sort of our hitch. Um, so this was really what we needed to figure out most was most important. And so I, I grabbed some of the sections of the code here. Um, but if you were really trying to understand our ordinance, we're happy to share the ordinance with you and even talk through some of these pieces if you, if you have some more questions. But so here's our here's our piece that really enables the um, vote to occur. And you'll see in B there, um, sort of the 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 uh, or the very beginning, it says, in the case of a historic district, the proposed design standards and guidelines shall only be effective if a majority of the owners of properties located in, within the boundaries of the proposed district sign a petition. So that's really what, what ours says. Um, we've interpreted that to actually mean more like a validated vote, so you don't have to walk around with a, um, a piece of paper and get people to sign a single piece of paper. Although that might be feasible if you just had 10 properties that were trying to form a district. But in this case, we send out a ballot. And you also notice it establishes some parameters. Um, there's going to be a 60-day voting period or a 60-day consideration period. And so from the time the ballots are sent out, um, there's 60 days for them to be returned. So ours also says that uh, it is a majority of property owners must agree. And so this means that it isn't just how many ballots are returned. Um, it is actually a majority of property owners. And so if there are, for example, 
400 developable parcels in a uh, proposed boundary, um, that would equal 400 votes. Some parcel owners will get more than one vote because they own more than one parcel. 50% plus one of parcels submitting yes votes is required to form the district in our case. Like I said, there was some horse trading here. Initially, the, there had been a request um, from, from some folks to make this two thirds or 66%, or which would have just made this impossible. Um, and even this is inc an incredibly high bar. Um, if you have genuine support for this sort of thing in your community, I would say you want a 50% simple majority of ballots returned. Um, if I had my say, I would, I would advocate for that. Um, if you aren't returning a ballot, um, should your voice really be heard on this matter would, would be my contention. So non-return ballots in our case count as no votes. Uh, as Megan likes to put it, in this case, you start with 400 no votes and you have to dig yourself out of that hole. In Brown's edition, we, we dug ourselves out of that hole. Um, the neighborhood really pushed hard. Um, we engaged with them as best as we could. We sort of stayed out of that voting process and just, just gave them updates. Um, but the neighborhood pushed it across and I think they ended up with about 54% of property owners submitting their yes votes. And really we only probably had about 40 no votes returned out of the 380 or so votes. So not a lot of people voiced their um, no opinion. Second, you gotta figure out how you're gonna, you're gonna uh, establish this district. Like I said, in, in Spokane, we create an overlay zone. And so uh, our, our ordinance already lives under the development, uh, uh, development regulations for the city. And so uh, and it sort of made sense for our legal folks. We didn't really, Megan and I didn't so much come up with this, but our, our, our help in the legal department said it, it really makes most sense to make this an overlay zone. And so as part of the district being formed, um, a overlay zone designation shall be recorded so as to also be reflected in a title search for a given property therein, and the designation shall be confirmed by ordinance. So it'll be an ordinance, the overlay zone will be created, and it'll be associated with people's titles so that it's known that they, they have to play by these rules. I have to say, we have not figured out how to do that yet. <laughs> Fair. So not recorded. Um, we do we do have figured out on the city's end um, how to make sure that COAs are caught and um, if, if a, a demolition permit comes in um, you can see here's our little internal GIS map and so any permit tech or any person in planning who's trying to understand what the what the development regulations might be in Brown's edition um, they, it's, it's showing right on the, the zoning map and it, it's it's uh, known citywide. It's not sort of something that's living in our little siloed um, historic preservation department. And we probably field two or three, um, maybe more um, emails or calls from our, our permit folks a month asking, hey, is this something that needs to be reviewed? And so they're doing a good job at, at catching these things that we could never catch ourselves um, if it wasn't really ingrained in the city's process. Uh, you can see Megan here with a big sign. Our ordinance also requires us to put up at least one sign in the neighborhood, um, but we put up two in this case, and so we had to put up a giant sign like this in the park, and uh, we had a big windstorm that took them de both down um, one time and had to, had to go get them back up again. Reviewing changes in demolition. Did you want to? I was going to, yeah, I was just going to talk about it really quickly. I just wanted, to be, this is sort of an aside, but not really. Um, that that we actually, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about a big ordinance um, revision that we did in 2018 that allowed us to create historic districts, um, working with one of our council members. But one of the things that we added at that time, and I just thought it was interesting enough that you might want to consider something like this, is that we actually now can say no to a demolition within um, a Spokane Register Historic District or of an individual Spokane Register property. We didn't used to be able to, even for individually listed properties on the Spokane Register. Um, we, we did the typical waiting days and we still have some waiting periods in there. Um, I think it's a 90 day window period. But what we added um, and what really strengthened our ability to say no is we put in these, it's basically five reasons why we can say no to a demolition, the six is really more about um, mitigation and um, uh, removal of significant architectural pieces. But 
but we, we, we codified this so that we had some legal framework to allow us to deny demolition in Spokane. So it's just something you might want to consider, and it is part of our ordinance as well. Um, but, you know, historic importance of the property, how the property would be re redevelopment or the redevelopment of the property, the condition of the structure, can it be rehabbed? Is it really so far gone um, that it can't be? And also, I thought this was interesting, the effect of the um, surrounding neighborhood um, on whatever is planned for the, the reuse. The overall effect of um, the, the neighborhood's character and elements of the neighborhood's urban design. So like if it would be taking away a park or if you had traditional alleyways or things like that, you know, so, so those were, were, so we have actually solid reasons right now why, how and why we can say no to, to demolition. So I just wanted to touch on that. And I think it's, uh, we also added at this time, national registered districts as well. Um, not so much, no, Megan? I thought we added that a COA was required for a national. A COA is required, but we cannot. Okay, but we can't say no. national. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We have the waiting period. What we also added in the national registered districts to fix that problem that we had is we can't say no, but we actually, as the Landmarks Commission, if a contributing structure in a national registered district is proposed for demolition, we actually have to review the um, replacement structure. That's what changed in the National Register. And they can't demolish anything until um, building permits have been approved and, and purchased for the replacement structure. Then we can sign off on the demo. You might, you might be wondering like, how would the commission determine the effect on the surrounding neighborhood? Well, we, like, like Megan said, we can withhold the building permits until, or withhold hold the demolition permits until we see their plans. Um, and, and we actually have used this on a national, um, for a property that was within our downtown boundary zone. Um, and we allowed for demolition, but also got some, some concessions that we would not have been able to get just three or four years ago. So passing an ordinance. Yep, I, I think this one was me and then, and then it goes back to you, Logan. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so, so basically, the, this is kind of getting back to that whole you know, having to actually really look at your ordinance. And I used to say this when I was a CLG coordinator, have you read your ordinance? You know, when I'd go out and visit communities and talk to commissioners um, and say, how many of you have actually sat down and read the, let you know, the, the, the code and the legislation that forms this program in your community? And oftentimes many people had never even looked at their own ordinance. So um, this was really a big deal. We had to, um, find a city council person that was willing and um, enough of an advocate to understand what we needed to do, which was really um, create something in our, our historic preservation ordinance that allowed us to create historic districts. That's how it started. And then it grew much bigger in terms of, um, you know, doing things like adding the demolition information and making it a lot harder to demolish stru historic structures in Spokane and doing, uh, you know, other things that just were cleanup things that hadn't been looked at in our ordinance for many, many years. So, so it was, it ended up being kind of a twofold thing, but um, so that actually did happen and we were really lucky and had a really great council person to, to really push that through. But also um, passing an ordinance when we're just talking about a historic district and creating that overlay zone, understanding um, the politics of the situation and trying not to put the historic preservation office in a tough spot. I think one of our proposed newest um, historic districts that we haven't done anything on yet but it's all about one building. And it's, it's one building that's owned by probably the most um, influential and powerful family in our city um, who also owns the newspaper. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like this one building's being targeted because they kind of talked about that they might want to demolish it. It's on the Washington Trust most endangered list right now, if you're curious. But, um, but what happened is the neighborhood around it was starting to think, well, maybe we should form a historic district in order to save that one building. So that's kind of, that's that's a good example of putting um, putting the historic preservation in kind of a tough spot um, for the, and, and I agree, it's really important that we save this one building, but we're, we're trying to work some other angles as well. Um, but you also have to use the neighborhood's sort of frustration and, um, 
and the loss of historic structures sometimes, that's that's kind of the way that you could get things started. They have to see an actual loss before people get engaged and, and want to see something happen. Um, if everything's just going along, you know, smoothly and there's no in, you know, bad infill and no historic buildings are being torn down, it'd be really hard to get a historic district passed. So sometimes that is the way that it works. Um, and as uh, the last uh, bullet point says, you know, it's best to be working on this project before a notable demolition is proposed. And that's kind of going back to that, that situation with the one important building. And well, the whole, the whole block is filled with historic buildings. This is a really important downtown block. Um, but it's just really difficult to start this process once um, somebody has already said, oh, we're, we're thinking about taking this building down. It's not it's in the way of our redevelopment of this block. Um, it just makes it it just makes it tough. Um, we were lucky in Brown's edition, our first district, that um, after we had lost a couple buildings, that same council person that worked on our ordinance re revision also did a demolition moratorium in the neighborhood that ended up going for about a year, I think, while we while we got the ordinance um, and the district formed. So that was really helpful and it slowed things down. I'll just add one thing. I think that uh, one of our one of the council members, who's now our council president, but the way that he sort of justified uh, passing this new ordinance that allowed for local historic districts is he basically said that that when neighborhoods want a tool to have some say, or, or that this would provide a tool for neighborhoods to have some say over the future of their neighborhood. And I think that really has rung true. Um, and so again, letting the neighbors drive that process is critical um, because if you don't have them driving it and it's your office trying to do it, um, you're just gonna find yourself in, in many challenges. Some that we're, we're finding ourselves in right now. Well, and I would say also, I think that's a great point. It was, I think some of that comment was in reaction to the fact that the planning department had just passed a very um, broad sweeping um, inlay uh, or in, inlay, infill ordinance um, for the city um, to allow for more density. And some of the targeted neighborhoods are, are, are you know, close in neighborhoods to downtown, which tend to be the most historic. And um, I think people started to get a little bit panicky about, you know, heights that were going to be allowed. And what what is, you know, if we're, we're, if we're trying to target our historic neighborhoods for infill development, um, you know, what is that? What does that mean for our neighborhood sense of place? Oops, can't hear you, Logan. Yeah, yeah, there, I, I have to do that once in this. Uh, <laughs> um, so forming a district, again, I kind of try to break it down into three major pieces that have to be done in order to form a district. Once you have an ordinance that, that allows for the process, you're ready to start on a district, the neighborhood is frustrated, what are the, the main things that need to be done in order to form that district? Um, so first is, you know, sort, sort of the thing that probably we're most familiar with is the required documents. Um, we're going to need a nomination. And in Spokane, we require some sort of resource forms, um, which is basically an, an inventory form for each property. We're still figuring out what exactly that looks like with each district. But at this point, they're pretty comprehensive descriptions and even some history of each property. Then the other main element is some design standards and guidelines. Um, I think Megan wanted to point out that, uh, that you know, you may just use uh, the, the Secretary of the Interior standards, um, but in our ordinance, it actually says that we will prepare design standards and guidelines for each specific district. Granted, I suppose we could just prepare a document that was basically echoing the Secretary of the Interior standards, um, but we are required to prepare something specific for each district that we work on. So those are your main doc the main documents you're going to need to prepare or, or hire a consultant to prepare. Then you have administrative steps. Um, because like I said, our uh, uh, ordinance lives in our development regulations, we're required to do uh, to notify commerce um, and to do a SEPA process. Um, both of which are things that we generally don't do in our office. We review SEPAs, but we usually aren't filling out checklists ourselves. Um, so we had to, you know, sort of wade through that. And then you also had to deal with the plan commission. Um, we needed to work through that process as well. Again, because it was in our development code, um, they, they're a recommending body for things that are in the development code. And so we needed to bring our proposal before them. And then you also have the actual ordinance drafting, the writing of this, uh, not the ordinance that, you know, created the possibility for districts, 
but the ordinance that will actually create this specific district. And so in Spokane, we had a specific ordinance for Brown's Edition. And now that is a section, the, the Brown's Edition Local Historic District is, is a specific section underneath our code. And, and I should say, rely on your legal help, your, your legal team, if you have one, to help you with this process uh, or, or council support. Um, to help with this drafting of an ordinance. Again, something our office doesn't have a ton of experience with, drafting ordinances. And so we relied on, on our, our help as we could. Neighborhood outreach. Um, this is the probably the hardest part of this uh, that isn't you know just, just sitting down and doing the work. Um, you gotta do sort of an initial contact and, and, and taking the temperature. Um, like I said, usually you want this to be generated by the neighborhood, probably reaching out because they've lost some buildings or because they're noticing changes that they, they're hoping to get control of. Um, but then also taking the temperature of the neighborhood, figuring out some way to, to determine if we're just hearing a loud minority or is this a real problem that, that is shared amongst the neighbors? And we don't, I'm not sure we've figured that out uh, precisely yet, how you do that, um, but you really need to rely on your, your um, your folks that are in the neighborhood to kind of take that temperature and relay it to you so you know if it's it's worth moving forward or not. The problem is sometimes people think that they're already doing a vote when they're coming, are you for this district? And then I get the weird emails that say, I, what is this about? You know, thinking that they're already va ballots out there. So it can get a little bit confusing. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And, and uh, being during COVID has only made this more challenging. Um, you have a first mailing, and I think that this is really critical. Um, getting this right is super important. And again, we'd be happy to share our first two mailings with you. Um, we had one to, to each district so far, and it's really sort of setting the stage, um, informing them that there's this process underway, how it was initiated, how they can participate, um, next steps. And usually I would recommend in this first mailing that you're announcing some sort of workshop or meeting um, that you can explain to them what's, what's going on. And so um, in, our, in our Canon um, mailing, we had announced a series of workshops that we promptly had to cancel because COVID started a week later. Um, but this is the kind of thing that I would include in this sort of first mailing. And then, like I said, a, a workshop series where you can really break down what's going on, um, tell them the exciting stuff about the nomination and why their neighborhood is so, um, such a fun story and significant for what reasons. Um, and then really start to build towards that next step, explaining them design standards and ultimately working towards a vote, um, which we're hoping we might be able to do sometime this year in Canada. Did I miss anything here, Megan? I don't think so. So the nomination resource forms, uh, like I said, this is probably the part that will feel most familiar. Um, we, we have prepared a, a nomination that really tells the story of the district and makes the case for why we think this district is significant and why it should be recognized. Um, and then looking at a more individual basis at each property, um, I've dropped a resource form here from Canon on the left and then on the right is one from Brown's edition. But we try to try to come up with a formula to assess integrity, um, provide a description, and then also sort of determine what is significant about the property and kind of try to capture that. You'll notice there's also some photographs. Um, and then we obviously keep the full size photographs with many more of them um, on the back end. Um, but we do include a couple of those in, in uh, the documents here. Sometimes we even include a historic photo. You can see there's one there, um, super cool. Looks, looks exactly the same. All right, Megan, I think you said you were gonna. Yeah, so let me, okay. I was just gonna jump in here. And so do you see my um, design standards? Okay, I'm assuming yes, because Logan would say something. I see. That. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So I just wanted, I'm not gonna exhaustively go over this, but I just wanted you to see really what we prepared for um, design standards and guidelines in Brown's edition. And as we were going through this process, and I'll talk a little bit more of our interaction with planners, but they were like, wait a second, we use the word standards in a totally different way than you do. So what we ended up doing is we actually codified the Secretary of the Interior standards um, in our historic preservation um, ordinance saying that those are our standards. And so that actually allowed us then to use this um, 
this document as, as really, yes, the standards are in here, but it's also talking about guidelines and guidance for property owners, for reviewers, so landmarks commissioners to use when we actually have review that comes up um, in the future. So it's not just like, oh, here's a listing of the, the secretary standards. This is actually something that um, is, you know, so we have the standards in here, but it's actually a really good um, resource for both property owners and the commission. So I just wanted to kind of jump around here just a little bit to show you, I'll go back to the table of contents. So basically we talked about, you know, certificate of appropriateness procedure Sorry, Kim, I'm wiggling my mouse around. She told me not to wiggle my mouse around. Um, but uh, so, you know, basically, what are these standards? What do they mean? What is the certificate of appropriateness? Uh, when do you need one? What are these different terms? Um, and then we actually went into like each chapter has, we had a chapter for existing single family residential. Then we had a chapter for existing multifamily residential. This particular, the Brown's Edition um, neighborhood only had a couple tiny little commercial buildings, so we did not even do commercial um, stuff in here. Um, but then we, we talked about district-wide standards, things that would apply to all properties, whether they're residential or commercial. Um, and you know some of these things like site and landscaping, we actually don't regulate, but we wanted to give some guidance. As same for paint. We actually in Spokane do regulate paint colors, if you can believe it, for individually listed properties. But for districts, we gave the Browns Edition community that was coming out to our public meetings a chance to weigh in. Do you want us to, to uh, look at paint or do you not? And they it kind of went back and forth and ultimately they decided not to have us look at paint. Um, one thing that they decided that they did want us to look at is in chapter seven, new construction, which would be um, garages and things that weren't attached to the historic buildings. They did want us to look at secondary structures that were being built. Normally for an individually listed Spokane Register property, we actually don't look at a, a detached garage. Um, so that was something different that they said, yes, we do wanna see what those um, secondary structures and ADUs, you know, accessory dwelling units and things like that look like. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of how we we set it up. Um, you know, we have a, a chapter on non-contributing buildings. It's very short because we don't do a lot of review of non-contributing. We still do review. They have to get a certificate of appropriateness. Um, but I think the biggest thing is probably the um, new construction section. And I'm just going to kind of jump in here so that you can kind of see. I'm just, I'm probably going backwards. Okay, so we're in the... It, we always kept the chapter at the bottom. So chapter three, existing single family residential. And then you could see which section we were in, which is porches and entrances on this particular section of the chapter. So you always sort of knew where you were. Um, so we really worked hard to try to make, um, so I'm going backwards obviously instead of forwards, but so that people knew how, how to um, get right to what they needed. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, restoring my porch on my existing single family residential uh, property. What do I need to know about getting a certificate of appropriateness? Um, we kept, we put the preservation briefs in and they're clickable so people can actually go to directly to the preservation brief. So I'll just move forward here a little bit. And so I'll just click. So this is like the district wide guidelines. We did add something in about solar panels and new technology and things like that. Some of the stuff we won't really regulate, but we just wanted to address these, these items that might come up in the future. You know, additions, obviously we do regulate additions. Um, so we just want people to think about all these different um, aspects of additions. This is where in Browns, they did want us to um, look at garages and things like that. So that's what we're, where we added that information. Um, so I wanted to get to real quickly. Um, so new construction, that's kind of our biggest issue in some of these neighborhoods is because of the new infill um, ordinances and code that's been recently adopted by uh, city council. That actually, as we're having these con constant con conversations about density, so new construction we knew was gonna be a big deal for this neighborhood. Um, so we actually really went into it and our um, consultants actually came up with 
I think what was a pretty innovative um, way to look at new construction. So first we talked about design strategies, like is are we looking for replications? That's what most of your historic um, homeowners and residents in a, in a district, they want us to make sure that people replicate historic buildings. That's not really the approach that we wanna take. Um, another, uh, we actually, what we lean toward is invention within approach. So using references to historic structures rather than it being like such a juxtaposition of, um, you know, something that would never be found in historic districts. So you know for sure that it was built in its own time. We, that's not really our thing. Um, this example at the bottom of this page, the condominium complex is actually in Brown's edition. It was built in the nineties, I believe. It's, you know, the form is okay. It's got a lot going on in terms of sort of style thrown at it. So we would probably, when we're looking at it now, would probably want them to remove a little bit of this ticky tacky um, stuff, uh, but, but, you know, in terms of its setback and its massing, where it's located within the neighborhood, it actually is, it is not terrible. Um, it's kind of terrible, but it's not terrible, terrible. So um, I'm just trying to find our, um, so I don't want to scroll through. So what we did is we came up with a compatibility of design rating. And um, this is actually just a score sheet that we can use as the Landmarks Commission on an initial, um, submission basically from an architect or a developer in a historic neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so basically I'm gonna walk through this. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll let Logan um, pull up our presentation again. There we go. So if we can go to the next slide. So the idea is um, this framework for compatible design. So we, especially in a neighborhood like Brown's Edition, there are so many different things happening. You have the big mansions that I mentioned. Um, you've got certain parts of the neighborhood that still have really kind of small single family homes. Um, so we actually broke that up into these character areas of the neighborhood. And, and it really made a difference in terms of looking at new construction. It had to be really site specific because in one part of that neighborhood, a five story um, apartment building might work. In another place, that would not work. That would absolutely overpower these small single family properties. So by doing this um, new construction framework and looking specifically at compatibility, we are e able to actually score these, um, these new uh, develop developments um, based on what's right around it. So that's this first section. Nope, now I'm seeing your full, um, your notes. I wasn't before Logan, but now I'm seeing like the, the presenter view. Unless you're trying to find something specific. No, right? no, let me try to fix it. When I, when we, when I went back to sharing it made it kind of crazy. So give me. Oh, one okay. One. You were fine in the, in the beginning of the, uh, whatever you had before you just did this last click. But you guys can still see this. Um, so it's, yeah, there we go. It's back, okay. So you can go, so this is, you know, like talking about the scale, massing and height um, as, as what's right around the, the property that's um, being proposed for new development. So we score that, go to the next slide. Um, design components, um, you know, the, the orientation to the street the quality of design, its presence on the street, you know, all of these things, use of facade material, like not trying to have too many, I think architects today, for some reason, they think putting, you know, metal panels and enamel panels and some wood and, and corroding, uh, you know, steel and some other things. They think that that just, I don't know if that's their idea of, um, you know, a, a good design, um, but, it seems like sometimes there's just they're throwing every different piece of material onto a facade. So, you know, using using accent materials. Uh, yeah, whoever uses the most materials wins. I agree. Right. It does seem like that at times. And that's been a problem. So, you know, we're, we're able to actually kind of score them uh, down a little bit on that um, if they're add, adding too many, um, too many uh, materials. We can go to the next slide. Uh, use of color, 
um, and not having too much, uh, you know, having one dominant color rather than having a ton of different colors. Um, you know, and, and I mean, we're basically just giving them all these things so that they can, they can also see the score sheet so they know what we're going to be looking at when we're reviewing this property. Um, facade design, you know, looking at articulation is, you know, are the window placements sort of similar to other things on the street? It can still be obviously compatible new construction that looks like, you know, a contemporary building. But one of the things that we've mostly said is we just don't want it to scream, I'm here, you know, like, look at me, look at me. It should blend in with the historic buildings around it, but it should be contemporary and compatible. So we think this is a challenge for architects that, you know, they have to be creative when they're coming into a historic district. And I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so we're back to, to you, Logan. So next I had some challenges and obstacles. Uh, I think this is uh, probably maybe one of the more interesting sections. What, what kind of issues are you gonna run into? So first I have just a quote, districts are anti-density and elitist. Um, in Spokane, both of our districts thus far, or the one that was successful and the one that we're working on, are neither of them are located exclusively in single family neighborhoods. Um, they're, one of them is exclusively in a residential high density neighborhood, and the other one is in just a wild menagerie of zoning um, that includes everything from office 150 feet um, to residential single family. And so uh, understanding that this criticism is going to be levied, that you're creating a district basically to uh, continue single family zoning in a place where there isn't single family zoning. Um, and so Think about your boundaries. Uh, where are you creating this district and how are you going to um, combat that criticism if it's levied? You know, I think uh, I'm surprised that we've received that criticism in some sense. I would have thought that we would have gotten a lot more of this pushback had we proposed a local historic district, say, around the golf course, um, which is equally historic, important um, place, but there's no development pressure there, or limited, I shouldn't say no, um, there's limited development pressure there. And so, you know, I would have thought that would have brought the, ah, oh, this preservation office is elitist. And, you know, I, I thought that would have drawn us criticism. But actually, we got that criticism in Brown's edition. Like, you are trying to prevent the densification of Brown's edition. And I think what's important to remember is, first of all, historic preservationists, we really care. We care very little about use. Yeah, sometimes we want to talk about it. But for the most part, we don't care about use. In Brown's edition, we don't say anything about it being residential high density and nothing we say will prevent more high density buildings from being built there. They may have to work through the new construction framework that Megan just proposed, um, but there's many um, places in the district where you could build a massive apartment complex and it wouldn't stick out because a lot of that infill happened in the 50s and 60s and so there's places. Um, and so a, a non-contributing structure in Brown's edition could very well be torn down and the big apartment complex could go up in its place. And as long as it met the, the, the design framework, it would, it would be okay with the district. And so I think kind of walking people through that process, helping them understand that the criticism really isn't, isn't valid. Um, and then also we got some of this, you know, you're, you're being a barrier to affordable housing and nothing could be really further from the truth actually. Um, everything that, about all the examples that we've shown you, the, uh, uh, the teardowns that motivated these districts, Big Blue, the one across from the park, and um, the one in Cannon, all three of those complexes did not, none of, neither, none of them provided affordable housing. Um, Big Blue, I know because I've found the rental uh, uh, advertisements, they're looking for $1,750 a month for, I think, a two-bedroom. The built, the, the, Apartments that were in those houses before, first of all, there was probably about 13 units between the two houses. I, I had spent the night in a friend's apartment in one of those buildings, in one of those houses many, many times um, when I came to visit Spokane. And so there's many units in there, lots of affordable housing, probably a, a average rate of five to $600, maybe less um, per room. All 13 of those units, the folks that live there were displaced. They got to find somewhere else to live. And and because not a single one of them, and I feel confident in saying this, not a single one of them was a potential resident of the building that was going to replace their building. 
And so really driving that home with city council, they didn't necessarily listen to us, um, but, but really trying to pr present your case. Um, and we were able to find plenty of advertisements for the rentals in the historic buildings and then show them the advertisements for the rentals of the new buildings. And so Megan and I have made a case that although we're not getting involved in use, that these local historic districts could actually protect affordable housing that's existed since the 40s or 50s or longer in, in large historic homes or, or even medium-sized historic homes. Second was negotiating planners. Um, I think that planners can be pretty nervous about preservationists wading into what is generally their realm of development regulations. And so, you know, doing that carefully, um, making sure that you approach them very early on. We actually had standing meetings with our planning department, I think every other week for probably about three months. Um, they gave more feedback than we could have hoped for. Um, and we did our best to incorporate the feedback. Some of it was really good feedback. And some of the things were things we, we had to discard because they, they would have compromised our intent and our purpose in creating the district. And so we really had to sort of, you know, appease them in some ways, also appreciating the, the good things that they brought to the table, um, but also standing up when we realized that this is gonna defeat the purpose of, of what we're trying to create in the first place. And then finally, and this challenge probably wouldn't have made my list, just uh, if we were doing this after Brown's edition, I probably wouldn't have brought this up. But after trying to do this during COVID, this is for sure one of the biggest challenges. Um, and it was during Brown's edition too, um, but, but now it really stands out. And so, so from the very beginning, you need to be sure about the neighborhood's commitment. Again, let them drive, let them call the office a few times, send emails, um, show up at their neighborhood council meeting and see how many people arrive. Um, really, really let them drive that. and, and make that a critical component of your decision-making process before you commit to the district or commit to working on the project. Um, I think that if your neighborhood loses uh, its interest, whether that's because they weren't really committed in the first place or because COVID happens and the neighborhood council doesn't meet anymore and people are worried about other things, it gets really hard to keep the process moving forward to feel like we're refining the design standards and guidelines in a way that the neighborhood actually cares about. And ultimately, to feel like someone's going to open their ballot and return it to us. Um, that's the ultimate fear and, and what's really got us on, on hold in our, in our project right now. Another thing, and this sounds kind of crass, but does the neighborhood have money? Um, we don't have a ton of money, um, and, and these things aren't free. Um, I mentioned mailings a few times. They're not cheap. They're expensive to send out a postcard or even just a letter. Um, and then also um, you're making a big sign like that, that, that you saw in the park. We made two of those in Canon. We're gonna need to make maybe three or four because there's so many entries to the neighborhood. And so uh, how, how are you gonna afford that? And does the neighborhood have any skin they're willing to put on, on the line? So I just, we just thought, you know, we talked a lot about all these things, but just to kind of give you a, the real world, this is actually what we did in Browns. And then Logan's gonna talk a little bit about Canon just so that you can actually see what, what the process looked like. I won't belabor this because I think we've talked about a lot of this stuff already, but you know, obviously don't expect it to be a quick or easy process. That's for sure. Um, we first, or I first met with the neighborhood council as, as we mentioned in the beginning or Kim mentioned, Logan actually lived in the neighborhood and I think you were still a master's student at that time. Um, but met with the um, council in 2015. I mean, that is, you know, I had just started in 2014 and it just takes a long time um, because they, that was the, the question about, well, why aren't you stopping these demolitions? And I said, well, I don't really have the power to. And so that was the, the loss that, that pushed things further. So we can go to the next um, slide. So this is, you can just kind of see There we go. So 2015, we met with um, the neighborhood, but really it took a while before, you know, there were a couple other meetings in there, but by late 2016, um, we actually had put up a, like a Brown's edition historic district website. And so you can go there. It's, it's, I actually put the link in the, um, in the chat so that you can see just what our actual project, um, 
website look like? And obviously we kept building it and adding things to it over time, but we met with neighborhood volunteers and the, the volunteers in 2016 were going out and doing that temperature taking. I think that all the data was pulled from our assessors and people, you know, they sectioned out the neighborhood and went around and just kind of talked to people about the possible district. Yeah, I was, I was, I actually did that. I was on the neighborhood council, just an at-large member and we took lists and we went and knocked people's doors and just said, is this something you want the neighborhood to look into? Was, was really and, the question. And it was- and I, yeah, I think we had like um, like maybe the the neighbor the volunteer group actually physically t contacted like thirty three percent of the 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 property owners, um, and of that a hundred percent said yes, we are ready to do this. And I mean, this neighborhood has talked about a local district for years and years and years. It's not like it's the first time it's ever been talked about. Um, but anyway, so that was that two thousand sixteen effort, and then. Um, that I mentioned that in 2017, a demolition moratorium was, um, was done in order to give us time to strengthen our ordinance and add that district creation um, provision. We also applied for a CLG grant during that time. This is a great grant project, obviously, as you all know. Um, so not until early 2018, we, we had spent, and I said six months, I think it might've been even closer to a year working on that ordinance revision. Um, with that council person and their legislative aid um, to get that done. It was actually passed in February of 2018. Um, we had to go through plan commission. We had to do all the same things that we did for the district creation. So we kind of start, we ramped right back up again. Um, and at that point, then we could actually hire our consultants. So we we didn't even hire our consultant until we had that um, that ordinance revision done. So we hired our consultants and they, they started working. Um, and then we started having much more regular um, meetings with Brown's Editions Neighborhood Council um, and created a brochure for the volunteers to use as they were out talking to people in the neighborhood. Um, we had a kickoff mailing. We had a couple workshops in late uh, 2018. Uh, the first one we talked about new construction because we knew that was kind of a big deal for Browns. Um, normally, I probably wouldn't start with that kind of, it felt a little in the weeds, um, but it was something that we knew was important to them. And then we did another one that was like frequently asked questions because, you know, you tend to get the same questions over and over again. So we sort of did it as that format, like here's the 12 most frequently asked questions for the neighborhood. And then we also began meeting with that internal staff. So again, no offense to planners. I know a lot of you are planners. Um, they totally look at things differently than we do. So we started meeting with our planners to go over our design standards and guidelines and our ordinance revision or our ordinance. We actually had to clean up some of that. Go ahead, Logan. Um, and this is just to kind of give you an idea. That I, this is sort of tongue in cheek, but basically all the, the stuff in the brown is my responses to the comments that were made by the planners. We actually had to have like this working spreadsheet of all their comments. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, you know, like this, this of course is all coming in once we've actually started meeting with the plan commission. So it was just, it felt overwhelming at times. And, but there were really good things that the planners had that we wouldn't have ever considered, but it's sometimes it felt like they were throwing up a lot of roadblocks for us too. And it didn't feel like they were being helpful. I know they were in their own planner ways, but um, anyway. So continuing on then in March of 2019, we're still working on this thing. Um, we announced, we sent out our last little, um, uh, postcard that announced the, the, the fact that all the documents were ready for review on the website and that we had our last public meeting for um, the neighborhood, actually. Late March, um, we had that final workshop. We talked about, that's where we really talked about the design standards and guidelines. That's when we kind of put out the survey and asked them, do you want us to do this? Do you want us to do that? Um, and then, of course, it also has to go through the Poor Landmarks Commission. You know, they're part of this as well. So they did a preliminary approval of the document so that we could then go through the plan commission process. We actually did three workshops, I think, for the plan commission on this. Um, and thank goodness we had already hammered out the fact that our ordinance was done and we could actually create districts in our community because that was all of a sudden, you know, they wanted to debate whether or not historic districts were a good idea. And it was, we had one of our most vocal opponents to historic districts the year before actually came and said the most 
I thought the most um, valuable thing. He said, you know, uh, Todd, uh, we already debated, you know, we already debated this a year ago when they came in and asked us about creating historic districts. Um, so that's that that ship has sailed. Like we're already past that. Districts can happen. So we're not debating whether or not a district can happen. They're really just asking us, you know, for a comment or a recommendation on the overlay zone that's already part of our code. So that was great. He had, um, voted, he had voted no. He, he had voted no. Yeah. Prior, and then he voted yes for the, the actual district. So it was really, yeah. really amazing cognitive dissonance from him. It was. It was it was great. Um, but basically, um, the, you know, we had our SEPA and our commerce notification, city council. We had to go to committee briefings. And then we finally had, once we were through the plan commission, um, who did end up voting seven to one in favor of recommending the district to um, city council, we were finally ready to go to vote in, ju in June of 2020, um, or no, that was 2019, sorry, wrong date. Um, June 19th of 2019, um, the uh, Landmarks Commission like basically voted, these are the final documents, and the next day we, vote, we sent out the ballots. And the ballots, actually, this is us stuffing the ballots, um, uh, the picture, because our first mailing, we forgot to mention this, our first mailing, somehow we sent it to the mailroom and one blank on one of the first 50 or so of the 300 plus um, mailings that we were sending out uh, didn't have a name on it. And so what it did is it like shifted all of our labels and ended up um, sending out the wrong name to the to the wrong address. So we were so scared on our ballots that we actually created ballots specifically for each parcel and we we checked them and double checked them and put them in the envelopes ourselves. <laughs> so that's how we did it. So we actually mailed them with a return um, envelope so that we were in hopes that we would get more back. So we actually finished um, our voting period in August. And then um, in November of 2019, we finally um, got the votes to approve the historic overlay zone. I just wanted to say a couple of things here. First of all, in this photo to the left, we have both our, our supportive council member in the back um, the neighborhood chairperson, but really the people who drove this effort. Megan and I did a lot of work and the consultants did a lot of work, but without these, this core people here, this would have never been possible. So I think that's- And the Spokane Preservation Advocates, a couple of folks from the advocates are there as well that um, are not local nonprofit for preservation. Um, they, they offered um, bodies to go walk and literally knock doors and make phone calls to people to get and back. Also, they also paid for some signs that went up in the neighborhood that said pro Browns on them, like little political signs basically that they put up. And one more thing I want to point out, and this is really mechanical, I just thought of it actually, is that when the, the neighborhood needs to find out how they're doing on the vote. Um, and so creating requestable public records that don't violate whether or not, that don't violate people's privacy is important. And so um, keeping a record of who's returned a ballot so the neighborhood can make a public records request for that. And then also keeping just basically a tally of how many votes, uh, positive votes have been received and how many negative votes have been received. And don't keep those two things tied together so that you can tell who voted which way. Um, because you want the neighborhood to be able to file a public records request for those documents without basically outing everybody who voted no and may maybe putting some negative um, neighborhood pressure on them that we don't have any interest in creating. Um, but we need the neighborhood to know where they're at, um, and we don't want to have to provide sort of a voting update every single day. Um, and so that's, that was a helpful tip that we didn't understand, and we ultimately had to fulfill a public records request that showed how people voted. And that was a little bit embarrassing for us, but um, next time we know how to make sure that, that that doesn't happen again. Because we were like just creating documents for people. Um, no, we were just basically we keeping it. We were, yeah, we were just like, yeah. Yeah. right on the same line, how this person voted, yes or no. Yeah. Didn't really, yeah. that was an Because we didn't realize that we weren't, weren't allowed to just like create a document. Like they, they said, oh, we'd like to request the, um, who has voted or not voted. And instead we, um, actually Kim asked uh, if we can, um, uh, talk about the toothy northern border on that. If you want to go back one, Logan, just the sure. map you can see here on Brown's edition. So we sort of went into this with the thought that we would not, um, we didn't want to include non-contributing properties on the borders. Um, 
for a couple different reasons. Um, one was just when we actually looked at how many properties that was, if we would, would have just drawn clean lines, it was going to create another, it was like another 70 or 80 properties, um, which for us, the mailing was costly. I, we have like no budget, you know, our budget is salaries and a tiny bit of, of mailing, but not much. Um, so, so it was that. And then also at that time, I was the only employee and just doing, um, you know, doing certificates of, of appropriateness on non contributing properties on the border, um, where we actually did really want to push development anyway, it just seemed, um, it seemed counterintuitive to us. We did get a lot of questions about why we drew in and out um, on that border. We, we decided we weren't going to do it quite the same way in Cannon, the Cannon District, but um, that was the reason why. We just didn't have the staff resources to be able to include 70 or 80 properties that were non-contributing on the border. Ironically, I think it made it harder for us to get our vote because a lot of the people that lived on the outskirts really supported it. There were a lot of condos of people who yeah. lived in the neighborhood because they love the historic nature and they live in a condo. So they really don't care about regulations to the outside of their home. And so we just, it, it would have made it easier for us really yeah. to push back for it. And so in, in Canon, you'll notice the boundary is much more, uh, is, is much straighter. <laughs> So um, just really quick going, oh, you were going to do this, Logan, but let's do this sure. super because we are getting short on yeah, time. Yeah, running out of time, I see. So yeah, we, we received a, um, 171 of 274 ballots back and uh, 201 of the votes were yes votes because um, remember some ballots had more than one vote on it. Um, so 82% of those who responded voted for the district and only 45 were no. Um, but because all of those no votes or all those unreturned votes count as no's, it, it ended up being 54%. Um, this is the actual ballot that we sent out here, like I said, specific with their parcel number. Um, but if people lost their ballot, we could also provide a blank one that they could include their parcel number. I think we had it right on our website. They could print it off and, and go to town. And we just wanted to just, you know, this is a really text heavy presentation. So we were like, I'm just gonna let, we're gonna run through a couple slides of just showing you the different resources in Brown's edition and how varied and different it is. It's a beautiful neighborhood. So this is just your eye candy portion of the, of the. You also notice there's lots of multifamily. This one in the top right corner is the first multifamily. Of course, I'm not remembering. 1880s, I think 1880s or 1890s, it was think, early. And, yeah. and you know, this the census shows a very, diverse working population living there. This one in the top center has been absolutely wonderf wonderfully rehabbed just recently. And it's beautiful, and you yeah. Tell the, the owners were already present at that point working on it, but now they're nearly, nearly complete and it's wonderful. Uh, you could also see some of the bigger resources that are in the neighborhood that allow for that increased density should somebody propose compatible design. It's a wonderful neighborhood. So quickly, I'll just run through Canon. I'll point out, like you said, that, that it's not as uh, jagged of a boundary here. Um, the jaggedness on the on the east side there on the right really it looks jagged but it's really not that's a very steep uh, geo, uh, geographic or excuse me topographic boundary there the the hillside really goes up and so that's really just drawing the property lines along the hillside and so we really try to not pay attention to is this contributing or not contributing and just draw a straight boundary that really made sense for the case we were making for this neighborhood which in this case is all transportation based. It's really a public transportation neighborhood. Again, sort of our process. Um, you can see the beginning of the process. Nobody is wearing masks and we're like having a jovial time outside at a block party. Um, and so we really were optimistic about our public engagement here. Um, this, this block party was great for us. We thought, wow, we are on track here. Um, and, and you can see we were charging right along um, but but very quickly we sent out that first mailing and things changed, changed um, because because COVID became a reality and um, we have done a couple uh, we've done a, a pop up info table where we went out and out outside and we sat in different places throughout the neighborhood and tried to answer people's questions which was not very effective but we're trying 
And then we've been doing some virtual workshops recently. The first one, 15 people showed up. And last week, nobody showed up. Um, so uh, we're trying to figure out how to make that engagement happen. The neighborhood council that used to meet on a monthly basis, every month for probably 30 years, um, has not met since March. Or since, yeah, I think since March. And so it's made our avenues for engagement that we were prepared to use much more challenging. And here's some more eye candy for you, this time from this neighborhood. Also very uh, varied styles. Again, lots of single family from cottages to large houses, but also multifamily like this apartment that I think is 1908. This is some, one of the more apartment heavy streets, but again, some really large row houses and, and things like that are um, pretty prominent in the district. I love this garage built into the hillside. This is my favorite. And I think that's all we've got for you. So happy to answer some questions or engage in any discussion that uh, um, you were hoping yeah. to. Yeah, that was a lot. Thank you both so much. That was amazing.